Good morning. Welcome to worship with Union Congregational Church. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to this gathering in which we celebrate that God wants to know who we are, how we are, and to take a Sabbath from that question which we more often ask one another, what we do. This Labor Day weekend, this Sunday in which we honor labor and work and ask what our faith has to say about our daily toil. I invite you in this moment to rest in the presence of God who knows and loves you, to breathe deeply of the Holy Spirit, to light a candle, see the presence of God in the faces of those gathered with you on the screen, to appreciate the cool air and sunny skies which grace us, at least here in New Jersey, this September morning. Recognizing that deep peace of Christ around us and within us. Let us share that peace now with one another. May the peace be with you. Peace. Peace be with you. Good morning. 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 everybody. Peace to Christ. Good morning. Hello, hi, Good morning. Good morning, Black family. Nice to see you. Good morning, see you, everyone. Morning, everybody. Hello. Good on early. Thank you, Marissa. You look great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Union Kong. Good to see everybody in the little boxes on Zoom once again. And it's good to be back with you after being away last Sunday. We have a number of announcements during the course of community time today, as you would expect with us heading towards kickoff Sunday next weekend and the resumption of the program year or a new program year next weekend. Next Sunday is kickoff Sunday and we would like, if at all possible, for you to send a picture to Betsy, who will put her email address in the chat in just a moment. I'd like you to send a photo to Betsy of you experiencing God's goodness this summer, wherever you happened to find yourself. And this will become a part of next week's celebration during kickoff Sunday. There are several things happening in the short term. There is a hymn sing that Eric will be leading this Wednesday evening. Men's group restarts next Saturday at 8.30 a.m. Youth group recommences on the 18th. We'll have a movie night on the lawn uh, while we'll be watching Little Miss Sunshine, 7.30 on the 19th. Outdoor worship will happen again on the 23rd. I don't expect you to remember uh, all of those things all in one gulp. So that's a reminder as much as anything to check our website and our newsletter and the weekly blasts that come out, usually late in the week, from Emily. And if you don't get the dimension or you don't get the weekly blasts and you would like to, please let us know at your earliest convenience. There are volunteer opportunities through the church that are um, being made available to you in this moment. Sarah Olson particularly is seeking to get back to doing some ESL uh, teaching and instruction at Mother Teresa House this week. Sarah could use some additional volunteers to help work with her. There are adults from three families who are eager to work on their English, which can improve their opportunities possibly for staying in the United States long-term. Please be in touch with Sarah Olson at your earliest convenience. And of course you should know because Sarah is who she is, that she is making sure that the instruction will be taking place in as safe as manner as possible, masked, social, socially distanced, and outside and you'll see her email in the chat in just a few moments with that being said we will continue our worship service thanks for listening
Thank you, Eric. We move on to our joys and concerns. Katrina and I have a couple of joys uh, uh, we'd like to share as your pastors this morning, one of which is uh, in gratitude for uh, Ina Asobi's leadership of the prayer meeting that has occurred over the course of the summer. Ina has led a prayer meeting once a week, um, and Katrina and I are now going to slightly tweak their prayer meeting for the fall, but we are going to continue with uh, the prayer meetings that we have been holding since the beginning of March when COVID first came around. So I will be leading a prayer meeting beginning on the 14th on Mondays at noon each week, and Katrina will be doing it on Thursdays beginning that same week um, for the course of the fall as long as we can. The uh, Zoom access will be through the same uh, Zoom room that we use for worship, and there'll be more information in the weekly blast and next week, and we'll talk about it again next Sunday. Additionally, we have enjoyed visiting with a few of you over the course of um, uh, the last few weeks. We have been able to do some visitation work, uh, trying to be masked and socially distanced and meet with some of you who might like a visitation from one of the pastors. We encourage you to keep getting in touch with us so that we can continue to do that work, and we look forward to providing visits for those who would like them. Karen Montgomery has asked today for prayers for her cousin, Helen Applegates, who has recently had a serious stroke. We also give thanks that Linda Griffin, former member and president of Union Congregational Church, is a, now a grandmother. Her daughter, Ashley, had a boy in July. Congratulate Cliff Lindholm IV on a hole-in-one this weekend. If there are additional uh, prayers, uh, joys, or concerns that you would like to put in the chat, please do so. While I just mention real quick that um, one of my joys over the course of the last month or so, um, and this is something that I've not really talked about in worship, is um, to give thanks for uh, basketball players, particularly professional basketball players in the NBA, who have shown leadership and courage over the course of the last several weeks in trying to address the racial justice movement in the United States. Now, you may not even be a fan of basketball in any variety, but recently we've been watching the professional playoffs and especially attuned to the Denver Nuggets games because we used to live in Colorado. We watched Denver win a big game recently with their 23-year-old guard, Jamal Murray, scoring 50 points in the game. Following the game, he was absolutely exhausted, but of course a sideline reporter put a microphone in front of his face within less than a minute of the game ending. He said, wow, what a win, that was a great win, but very quickly transitioned to talking about matters of social justice. Imagine the poise and leadership and integrity it takes to have the game of your life and then immediately move the conversation past yourself and your team and the sport that you love and play to talking about matters that are far more important for our nation. So I congratulate those players on their leadership, courage, and integrity, and can tell you this, that as a father to a middle schooler, it matters. It really matters what these gentlemen have to say. Sally offers prayers for her mother and aunt who are both scheduled for surgeries on Tuesday this week. And Jane uh, asks for continued prayers for Samantha as she recovers from a stomach infection. People of God, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give thanks. We give thanks for the ways in which we have been inspired this week, inspired by the glory of your creation inspired by the saints that live among us, those who have taught us to be our better selves, those who have taught us how to do something with greater integrity, for our educators in all their many contexts. We give thanks that the old commercial does have it right with respect to children in school, that it is the most wonderful time of the year, back to school this week. And yet our children 
Our children, oh God, they need resilience and courage. Our children need their social structures and their friends. And our teachers and administrators need all the fruits of the spirit that they can muster within themselves and that you continuously provide this week and this month of all weeks and months. We pray for our teachers and administrators that they may experience your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We might add courage into the mix too in this moment. We pray for our educators, those who teach in public or private schools, in kindergarten or college and everything in between. We pray for our nursery school here at Union, for Lynn Kulik and her courageous leadership to continue, for our teachers, parents, students, caregivers, and families. We pray for grandparents who now are tasked with providing far more care than they had ever done previously, and for parents, those who work at home, those who work outside of the home, and perhaps most especially on this Labor Day weekend, those who struggle to find work, those who are struggling to pay the rent and provide food for themselves and their children. Our hearts break, oh God, at the thought of what's happening and what appears to be happening in America. We cry out for brave leadership, for virtue and integrity, for Americans to ensure that Americans are not hungry, for Americans to have access to essential health care, for Americans to have a roof, not just any roof, but a safe roof, a roof, but not just any roof, a roof that does not leak, under which clean water comes from the tap. We remember, holy God, that in America, in our nation and among our people, we are called to feed the hungry, provide water to the thirsty, shelter to those who have none. Help us to witness, Holy One, the many instances of hope and compassion and patience that surround us. We're continually caught off guard and as such, our eyes are drawn to all that is troubling. And indeed there is much that is troubling. So much is happening seemingly everywhere in the news. We pray for the people of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and the people around our nation who are pursuing justice. Help us not to turn off our sense of caring in the face of all these many deep troubles. Restore our value, the unity and faith are the tinder for our goodness and creativity. Help us to focus on acts of the heart and our acts of the heart. May those acts of the heart produce words because words matter. What we read and write and say and print and broadcast really matters. Help us to understand how easily our words can be like stones, our very speech setting forth or putting forth violence or love or kindness or gentleness, depending on what our words are. Open our eyes, soften our touch, and lessen our anger, we pray. Dear Lord, you call us forth when it seems as though there is nothing that we can do in our corner of a world, our little spot, our shelter in the storm. Bless us, we pray, with the fruits of the Spirit. Grow within us your remarkable love. Help us to discern and forgive, honor and respect and trust in your Holy Spirit at work among your people. Remind us again, Holy God, how to pray as we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. This is the scripture reading for the day. Luke 10:38. 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. 
there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Hi, can the kids give me a wave out there so I can see where you are? I see, I see you, Ted. <laughs> Have you ever gone to a Japanese restaurant and been presented with one of these? This is a uh, Ishibori towel. It's a, it's a, a bit of hospitality and invites you to wash your hands before your meal. If you ever visit a Chinese home, I bet you're not there very long before they offer you tea. That's another kind of hospitality. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble here. And if you are visiting the kind of remote areas of the Navajo reservation where water, running water in people's homes is not the norm, if you visit a home that does have running water, you are presented with a glass of it almost immediately upon arriving. So those are some various kinds of hospitality. And I'm wondering what your role is as a kid in the household when guests come to your house. Do you meet them at the door? Do you take the coats and hang them up? Do you offer anything to the guests? Or maybe as the kids there, you're more likely to be in charge of any kids that arrive. Is that something that happens? Maybe you uh, go off with the kids to play in another room or outside or do some video games. Is that more of what the kids responsibility is as a host? I think some of that makes sense. But what if guests arrive in your house and there are no kids? Do you hang in the same room with those adults and listen to what they say or do you go off somewhere and uh, just pretend there isn't any company there? In the story that Jane just read us, we hear about two very different reactions to guests in the home. One of them is Martha, and she's very busy fussing around and preparing food and being thoughtful about what Jesus might need to um, help his body, whether he's hungry or whether he's thirsty. And Mary, on the other hand, she just sits at his feet and listens, listens to every word that he is saying. So those are two very different kinds of hospitality. And I think about that today and we are influenced by our families, what our families expect us to do when people arrive at our home, but we're also influenced by our culture. And at that time, in Bible times, Martha, or all women really, were very much expected to be fussing in the kitchen and coming up with a meal to present to any guests that arrived. But Mary, really goes out on a flyer and just sits at Jesus' feet. And that is a different kind of hospitality, but it's still hospitality. And you might see that when guests come to your house, is do you have one parent that's in the kitchen kind of doing the preparation and another parent that is actually visiting with the guests? And maybe they switch off later. You can't just have guests come to your house and everybody's in the kitchen, or can you? So as I was thinking about this, and this story has been used for years and years and years, and people would always say, who are you, a Mary or a Martha? How do you see yourself? And I think there's a part of me that has always been a Martha. I do want my guests to be fed and have something to drink when they come to visit me in my home. But after so many months of not having anybody visit me in my home, when they come, I'm a Mary now. I want to just sit there and listen to what they have to say. And maybe that's why Jesus says that that was the better choice, to sit and listen to your guests, what they have to say. 
that's really what it's all about. That's a very important part of hospitality and it's how we learn about each other. So whether you're a kid or whether you're a grown up kid, being a host is something that comes from your personality. And if that is something that's changing because of everything we've lived through in the past six months, welcome that. Let us pray. God of hospitality, we can learn from you. We certainly learn from the stories that you have left us in the Bible. And we ask you to continue to help us grow into whatever hosts we will be in the future. Amen. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never seeking, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I am, raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope that I can bear me to arrive at home. Keep us off me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he who rescued me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, any time constrained to me, let my goodness like a fetter. But my wandering heart to thee. Praise the one, Lord, I feel it. Don't believe the God I love. He is my heart. Oh, take and see it. See it for thy courts Essential workers risked health and safety to report for duty while many of us stayed home. Farm workers toil away with smoke from forest fires hanging dangerously near. Women report doing far more of the household labor and child care, even when juggling their own jobs. Zoom meetings dragging late into the night and emails being sent at ungodly hours. All this while tens of millions are unemployed. We live in a hard working society. And in this time of disconnection and isolation, disparities and inequalities in work continue to be revealed. If you are human, you have likely felt the exhaustion and burnout and stress of feeling like you are doing all the work, so to speak, that you are doing more than your fair share. And at some point have dreamed of a time or a situation in which work, in which life, it's just a little easier. I'm doing all the work by myself, Martha complains. Jesus' response, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, 
which will not be taken away from her. This is often read as a rebuke of Martha. It's read as, as an admonishment for her own personal anxieties, for her missing the point of precious time and learning with Jesus. Maybe it even gets read as Jesus sending Martha back to the kitchen to toil away alone. But maybe Jesus is actually commiserating. Martha, you have so much to do. You are working so hard. With me, there is no need for such toil. I don't care about a fancy feast. I just want to relish this time together. Please come sit with me and Mary. Maybe Jesus is pushing back against the wall of messages that Martha has received that told her she was only as good as the work that she did. That she would only be worthy of attention or abundance or grace if all the work was done. You know those messages. They are deeply ingrained in our culture. They tell us we are what we do. That we can't rest until the house is clean all the emails are answered, that we shouldn't take all of the vacation we are entitled to, that we should teach our children to figure out what they love so they can figure out how to get paid to do it. And those same messages tell us that it would be dangerous to extend unemployment benefits in the midst of a pandemic in case workers don't want to return to work because they are making more money staying at home. The same messages that tell us that we can't, as a society, just give away food for free, but must require people to work for it. Otherwise, the very fabric of our society will unravel. I'm calling today Labor Sunday, a Sunday in our liturgical cycle that falls on Labor Day weekend, to lift up themes of work and labor, to recognize that our faith has something to say about our work. Labor Day itself in the US was founded in the late 1800s at a time in our country's history when most people, and I mean most people, including young children, worked seven days a week in low paying jobs that were physically demanding from farm labor to factories. And in 1882 in New York City, 10,000 workers went on strike and marched through the city to a picnic in the park on their signs, they called for less work and more pay, an eight hour workday, and a prohibition on the use of convict labor. They were met with cheers. In some ways, the standards of work in this country have come a long way from that time. But in many ways, we have re regressed. We know that Americans work more hours than people in similar countries worldwide that more Americans work multiple jobs, more Americans are in poverty despite working at least one job, and that there is inequality embedded in this. People of color and women must work longer and harder for the same pay that white men earn. In the pandemic, the inequalities of physical hourly work that risks physical harm for those workers compared to white collar office work, which could largely be done from home, are laid particularly bare. And then there is all the unpaid labor that is also essential. The care work of children and elderly and disabled people, the housekeeping and food prep, the emotional labor and cooking, the list goes on. How many of you claim to be retired and yet spend hours each week caring for grandchildren or volunteering your time or work to this or other institutions? Convict labor, the only form of legal slavery that exists in this country, continues. Most recently drawn to the headlines once again by incarcerated people in California who regularly labor to fight forest fires for pennies. Are you exhausted? Who's working the hardest? Who deserves a break? Who deserves the time and attention of our reforms? Less work and more pay sounds pretty good for many people right about now. An eight hour workday? I know plenty who would sign up for that. And so what do we make of Jesus's response to Martha? There she is working away in the kitchen, 
and Mary just chit-chatting with her feet up with the pseudo-celebrity in their house. Does Martha's complaint fall on deaf ears? Is Jesus perpetuating the inequality of labor and patriarchy? Clearly, Jesus is terrible at adjudicating fairness. Shouldn't Mary have to share the work with Martha? Maybe Jesus should cook dinner for a change. It's totally unfair. But Jesus's ethics here and in so many of his teachings, he's not looking to fairness as the measuring stick for what is right. In other places in the gospel, he tells people to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's with no instruction as to what a fair allocation might be. He instructs landlord farm owners to pay workers the same regardless of how long they have worked. That's not fair. He seems to be okay just to give away free food to people who might not deserve it. Fairness, it seems, is not a gospel value. This story is sandwiched in the Gospel of Luke between the parable of the Good Samaritan, story about mercy, and the teaching of the Lord's Prayer, a request for daily bread. Mercy and abundance are above fairness for Jesus. I had a coworker when I worked at a casino in Philadelphia who had worked in fast food before that. And at the time, the Fight for 15 movement was sweeping the country. And we were having many conversations at work about it. Most of the front of house workers, like me, were making $15 an hour already. My coworker who worked in environmental services made a little bit less. But her hourly wage was far more than she had made in fast food. She was glad to be making more now, although she still really needed to make more to have a life that didn't wax and wane in two week cycles. But she really didn't think it was fair that someone who was working fast food now would get an immediate raise to $15 when she had worked so long at the same job for less. She was more concerned with the unfairness of that than her own possible gain. And to be honest, we all have this inclination at times. There are so many variations of it, the way we so basely desire things to be fair, meaning the same. I see this already in my son, who is just three. When I push him to share and threaten that the toy will get taken away if he doesn't, he will sometimes gladly hand the toy over to me to be confiscated, rather than letting his friend have a turn. Now, of course, we adults do this in far more sophisticated ways. But in our political landscape, we are more afraid of giving things away for free, of possibly helping someone who doesn't really need help, than we are of not giving help to those who really need it. Our welfare programs are defined by income limits, as are our public health programs. When free public university or community college became a political issue, the sticking point for many was that it wouldn't be fair to provide that to people who could already, in theory, afford it. It wouldn't be fair. We each feel like we are doing all the work, and so we can't just give these things away for free. We justify disparities in pay with lists of qualifications. Some jobs require more education, more skill, more soft skills, more cultural competency, more something. And that's why we deserve to get paid more than the janitor, the fast food worker, the farm worker, the childcare worker, the person who just started. The past six months have made plain some deep anxieties and priorities in our society. It has made plain that the work we rely on the essential work, and yet we continue to pay most essential workers far less than those whose work might be a little less essential. We have balked at extending unemployment benefits to tens of millions of people, lest we de-incentivize returning to work, while at the same time distributing billions in bailouts to certain industries. 
The only index which has matched the exponential increase in billionaire earnings has been the length of lines at food pantries. Jesus isn't worried about Mary getting back to work, about what might happen as she lingers a little while longer with him. Neither does he make sure that Martha is doing twice the work, that she's getting Mary's work done too. His priority is something more important. The story is not about demonizing Martha or glorifying Mary, but we can hear it as an illustration, as a mirror to our own anxieties about hard work that are deeply rooted in Protestantism and Western culture. Jesus doesn't exactly weigh in on the Protestant work ethic, but he does demonstrate presence that isn't rooted in getting it all done or adjudicating who is working harder. His attention, his generosity and ministry is for those who work and those who don't, those who have something to share and those who have nothing. Jesus offers us a freedom from the feelings of competition and scarcity that are so ingrained in us that consciously or not, it limits our imagination and politics from striving for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus shows us that collectively we can afford to grant mercy and daily bread to all people. This Labor Day weekend, we remember the labor movement that brought us the weekend, as the bumper sticker claims. But we remember too that Jesus doesn't show us how to be fair. He shows us how to be more than fair how to be merciful and share in God's abundance. Shows us to grant rest to those that seek it, including ourselves. To provide daily bread, even to those who cannot pay. And to share that which has the most value, time, relationships, and the presence of God. And to not worry so much about all the work that needs to get done. Amen.
As we approach this moment of prayer, I'd like to encourage all of us to take a few moments, and often these are rare moments for modern people, to breathe deeply, to breathe of God's goodness, and to try and focus on the joy of quiet meditation for a few moments. People of God, let us pray. Almighty wind, breath of God's spirit around us and within us. Grant rest to those who labor this weekend. May we be rejuvenated and refreshed for the work that lies ahead. Bless us, our community, and our nation as we pursue an economy that works for all. Bless us with a spirit that seeks generosity more than fairness. That seeks health for all rather than for some. That seeks common and communal blessing. We give thanks for the breath that is within us. Enable us to rest. Enable us to be rejuvenated for the work that lies ahead. Amen. People of God, this Labor Day, may we be reminded that Jesus doesn't show us how to be fair. He shows us how to be more than fair, how to be merciful and share in God's abundance. So may you and may all people find rest and daily bread. May you have time for that which matters most and not worry so much about all the work that needs to get done. May it be so, amen. Thank you.